Marion, apparently you get the get the number. Welcome aboard. Yes, thank you. Good to see you. <laughs> and so I'll know we are being recorded now. So the um, recording will be available by YouTube link, and I'll be able to email that to you if you so desire. It'll be the recording of the lecture in its entirety for our digital archive files with the Maine Ulster Scots project. And John, you're on anytime you feel comfortable. All right. Thank you, Julie. Sure. Uh, we'll start by just welcoming everybody aboard. There's people that we've met before, some that we haven't, and some that probably haven't logged in yet. Uh, but we'll we'll get started anyway. The uh, there we go. The main Elsa Scotts project is a 501c3 organization, and we've been operating in various capacities for about uh, 14 years now. And uh, pro our uh, goal is to save and share the stories of the Scots-Irish in Maine. We're not going to get into the details of why the Ulster, Ulster Plantation was settled in the beginning or the background history of Scotland, but we're going to focus on the arrival of these uh, Scots-Irish immigrants to the Casco Bay area and uh, how they managed to uh, pull themselves together into a viable community, much through their own efforts. Uh, I'm John Mann, as, as if you didn't know, and uh, Julie's, Julie's going to be taking the second half. We're going to divide this into two halves. In my half, we're going to be talking about land possession, family, creating community, creating commerce, and self-governance. And that's going to lead into the beginnings of the American Revolutionary War, which uh, Julie's going to cover. Just a quick background, of course, at the time of 1718, in the beginning of the arrival of the Scots-Irish from the north of Ireland, uh, the, the, what is now the state of Maine was pretty well divided up between French interests to the east and uh, English interests to the west and the Native American interests to the north. So it was a border country and border country was nothing new for the Scots-Irish. Borderlands had been their home for, for centuries. What, what, may not, what may come as a surprise to some of the people that are early in this research is the amount of traffic that took place between no the north of Ireland and the New England area and uh, Dave McCausland, who's with us today, and Bill McKean have done quite a lot of research on that. And I'll just pick a couple of items from their research. Uh, there's a lot of talk about the five ships that arrived in 1718, but there were actually 19 ships that came in that we know about into uh, New England area in 1718, and 11 more ships that came in in 1719, followed by 13 in 1720. So. Obviously, this is a massive uh, immigration for that time period. And the arrival put, put them right in the frontier land between the European settlement and the Native American settlement. If you have questions along the way, I don't mind you interrupting because it will make sure that we're on, on the topic that you want to talk about the most. At the time of their arrival, New England had been through a series of Indian wars which had left the district of Maine in, in great devastation. Basically all the European settlement east of York had been wiped out. Uh, at the uh, Candlemas massacre of 1692 had involved several hundred people being attacked by French and Indian forces. And one of the families that took the hardest hit in that, in that conflagration was uh, the Dummer family. And the Dummer family is, is the source of the land title that we're going to be talking about today. The Reverend Dummer and his wife, Reverend Dummer was killed and his wife and child were uh, abducted during that time period. The Dummer family themselves were, were a uh, commercial 
and uh, political family from Massachusetts with a lot of a lot of strings. And they had acquired what we're going to refer to over and over as the Dummer claim. If you take a look at this map from the 1750s, I've got circled in red the Dummer claim area, which is now the eastern part of Freeport, tucked up against Brunswick. It was part at that time of the larger area known as North Yarmouth. But the infrastructure for the village of North Yarmouth was 10 miles away by water. And the infrastructure for the Brunswick community at the falls was eight to 10 miles away over land. And it left the Dummer claim settlement perched off by themselves out of, out of the benefit of any infrastructure having been created. And they were virtually on their own, which gives gives them a, a special quality of being able to study a nascent society of Scots-Irish, basically making it day by day, even though they had contacts with the larger world, day to day on, on their own situation. Here's a map that shows the Dummer claim, which was acquired by the Dummer family uh, prior to King William's War and then abandoned during that time period. It's described as being some 900 to 1,000 acres and it probably was all of that. Behind it, you'll see these, these lotting square, rectangular square lotting patterns, which was part of the North Yarmouth settlement. The North Yarmouth settlement, of course, was a basically Puritan congregational church homestead settlement, whereas the Dummer claim was separate from that in its land title and did not operate on a homestead system. Adjoining it and surrounding it were proprietor committee lands, which we'll talk about in a minute, which also became sold for fee interest rather than by homesteading. So you had this Scots-Irish community here in the Dummer claim surrounded by uh, congregational Puritan based uh, Massachusetts uh, pioneers. Uh, as a little bit of background on the Dummer family. Basically in 1722, a descendant of the original owner, Richard Dummer was the original owner, uh, a great grandson, I believe he was Jeremiah Powell, uh, inherited the interest of the Dummer family in, in Freeport at the Dummer claim. And he was also a member of the Committee for Resettlement. During the Indian Wars previous, land titles, land property had been abandoned. And when, when the property owners and others started to re, re, resettle the area, somebody had to sort out whose claims were valid and whose weren't. So a committee was formed to do that and Jeremiah Powell was on the committee. So he ended up owning the Dummer claim itself, plus had an interest in the surrounding committee lands that I showed you on the earlier map. This is a nice map that Ed Coffin put together and the green in the bottom is the Dummer claim with all of the lots that were created out of it and the different families that were involved, all Scots-Irish. And the yellow land immediately adjacent is the committee land, which was also divided up and sold to Scots-Irish. So to the east, you had the Brunswick community under, under Reverend Woodside. And to the west, you had the North Yarmouth proprietors from Massachusetts. Trying to move right along. There we go. I think I missed one. No, maybe they're just out of order a little bit. That's all right. Uh, I put this one in specifically to talk about uh, what it took to establish a home at that time. And uh, I've looked at a lot of different descriptions of log homes from that time period. And the one that I found closest to what we discovered at the McFadden site, 1718 McFadden site on the Kennebec River is described as follows. The walls of a log home were made of a were basically a rectangular structure built, thus built and covered with, bar with bark or thatch. The enclosed earth was excavated for a cellar which was unwalled. That sound familiar to you folks that worked in the McFadden site? 
The excavation was then planked over with riven logs of pine and a trap door in the center of the floor let you down into the bowels of the primitive structure consisting of a single room below and a garret above to which a ladder led the ascent. The one, in one corner of the log of the single room, excuse me, in one corner of the log walled room, a large fireplace opened, in, opened its cavernous depths. The back and one side was built of stone with a wooden post set in the opposite jam supporting a horizontal beam for a mantelpiece. Through the bark thatch or slab roof or outside and up the back wall of the building was reared a bob work of cleft wood whose interstices were filled with mortar clay and in places there was brick or mortar called cat and clay. Very similar description to what I think we found at the McFadden site. That description came from ancient dominions of Maine uh, written by someone named Sewell. I found it in three centuries of Freeport by Cross and Harmon if you want to take a look at it and compare it to what we did at McFadden's. This picture is of a Patton family log structure that was built for logging camp. The Patton family started in the Dummer Claim and uh, extended their family north into northern Maine and uh, they were still using the the uh, dovetail cornered construction into the mid 1800s. Uh, this is of kind of a keen interest to me and it runs counterintuitive to a lot of the talk that you hear about Scots-Irish and the impoverishment that came with them from the north of Ireland. The people that settled at the Dummer Claim, this is from the deed to Gideon Mann. And uh, I, sh I should mention that the date of this, this uh, lecture that we're giving today is on the anniversary or the birth date of Gideon Mann, some 200 and how many years? 327th anniversary of his birthday, our great grandfather. 327th anniversary yes. of Gideon Mann's birth. Yeah. Uh, Julie and I being descendants, and probably some of you are. Uh, he purchased his 100 acres in the Dummer Claim for 93 pounds, 6 shillings, and 8 pence. That, my friends, is a lot of money in pounds sterling. When all the people around them in the North Yama settlement were acquiring their land by homesteading, by clearing so many acres of land, building a structure, and fencing in so many acres of land in a given time period, in order to acquire title to their property. The Scots-Irish at the Dummer Claim were paying pounds sterling in cash for their property. Uh, this is very different from the later descriptions of the Scots-Irish that came into Pennsylvania in the 1740s and 50s, being desperately poor. These people apparently had taken advantage of the early sale of their leaseholds in the north of Ireland while the market was still available to give them some return on that leasehold value. Later on, the, as people left the north of Ireland, real estate prices collapsed and economic conditions deteriorated due to droughts and famines and, and uh, government regulations and import export regulations. Uh, so th many of these people were much better off than the Scots Irish who came later, and I think that's uh, that's something that uh, has been overlooked to a large degree. Uh, there's a close-up of the map, and it shows you who these families were. The Andersons had come on the 1718 group. Uh, when they actually arrived at Flying Point, we're not exactly sure, but it was quite early. Nobody down there got a deed to their property until the 1750s but we're pretty sure that most of these families were on the ground and starting out prior to that. Uh, they didn't get a deed because the, the, the Dummer family hadn't gotten around to getting their claims settled and deciding what they'd wanted to do with their property. And it didn't get resolved among the, amongst the ears of the family. But originally the, the area had been acquired as in the hopes that the Dummers could establish a, uh, a Northern source for farm animals to sell to the Boston Massachusetts market as more and more immigrants came from Europe. There was a high demand for, for livestock and the area around Boston was getting used up for farmland so they had moved east 
and they'd made a foothold here, but they lost it during the Indian Wars. So the land became available. And the Scots-Irish bought it. But they were isolated. Let me see if I can get this computer to move ahead. There we go. So how did they manage to organize and uh, be successful in that environment? Well, there's a couple of petitions that we find early in the record that give some indication. By 1763, they were petitioning the government in, in North Yamas to help them build a road through to Bunganut on the town line with Brunswick so they could go to the mill and the meeting and other conveniences. To go to a meeting in North Yarmouth meant getting in the boat and sailing to Royal River and attending the church services over there, which were a congregational system and not a Presbyterian system. Whereas if they could get to Bunganuck and beyond, they could uh, participate in Presbyterian and, and, and uh, services and deal with other Scots-Irish uh, uh, conveniences, as they put it here. There was a mill at Bunganuck that was established by Reverend Woodside's grandson. And we'll talk about that a little later. But you hear, see here the same families, but you also see some families that are here that don't own property. Their names don't show up in the deeds. So if you're descended from this group, you may not even be aware that there are some people here that you might not have run into, such as Thomas Campbell and Silas Wentworth. I don't think was ever a deed in his name, was it, Julie? Uh, John Ray and others. And then later, they, they became, there it is, that went up very nicely. Later, they became embroiled in a dispute with North Yarmouth when the town of Freeport petitioned to be set off as a separate town from North Yarmouth. Uh, they wrote a petition back to the, to the selectmen of North Yarmouth saying, we don't want to be set off as a separate parish. We want to continue on as we are. And as we are turns out to be, if you, read, if you can read the red fine print, that they have their own minister and this, the pay for that minister is being provided out of the taxes being paid to North Yarmouth in the form of a rebate of 28 pounds a year. So somewhere along the way, North Yarmouth said, yes, uh, you people are part of our, our organization, our township but you're so far away that we understand you need to be able to take care of yourselves. And uh, here's some kickback money because you're obviously not using up our infrastructure over here. You're not attending our schools. You're not using our roads and you're not using our minister. So they had a little world to themselves over there. And we've got George Rogers. Uh, you've got the Chases and the, and the uh, Hueys, Wentworths, Campbells, Pickerman, Mann. Guggins, Anderson, Cobb, Dill, more Andersons, and a gentleman by the name of Cruer, C-R-U-E-R, who later I think changed his name to Brewer, and I'm not sure what the heck his origin was, but he was in amongst the Scots-Irish at the Dummer Clan. The people in the Dumb Acclaim naturally had to help each other out a good deal. And one of the things that they would have had to help help with was harvesting harvesting timber. Somebody asking a question? It's Earl. Oh hi Earl. How you doing? Very good. All right. So the the greatest source of income at that point in time was to sell timbers for the King's Mass to the Royal Navy. But if you cut down a pine tree that was over 100 feet long and four feet on the butt, you weren't gonna haul it out of the woods with a pair of old steers. You're gonna need a lot of steers and everybody in the neighborhood would have had to chip in to do that. The mast landing that was, a, that was acquiring the mast to ship to, to England was uh, three or four miles to the western at, at mast landing in Freeport. And the Manns and the Andersons and others would have had to bring in all their animals and work together to get that accomplished. But they would have acquired 
a pretty darn decent income from it because the King's Mass at that, at that time were uh, going for a very high price. Another thing that they had to do was uh, take care of their own dead. And this became a community effort, as we've discovered, because the cemetery that's there in the center of the Dummer Claim on the old John Mann property uh, contains the remains of multiple families. And uh, there's at least 150 people buried down there, if not a good deal more that we haven't found yet. Each of these blue flags represents a burial site that we've been able to uncover with the help of archaeologist Pam Crane. Uh, it's, a, it's a fascinating spot and, it, and it's interesting because at the time of these burials, there would have been a town cemetery established in Freeport where the old town hall was. And there was a church cemetery established at the Congregational Church in Freeport, but neither one of those places was used. They stayed here on their own property and were buried among their own neighbors in a, in a large Scots-Irish community cemetery or grave, graveyard. The Scots-Irish in the 1750s, 60s, and 70s were burying their dead with, with mo mostly with markers, not always with markers, but most of the time with markers. And the markers were made from local shale or, or, uh, or uh, schist from the shoreline along the waterfront right next to the cemetery. In fact, if you go down over the bank a little bit, you can see the tailings from where they chiseled out these headstones to make them into various shapes. This one has the pointed shape at the top Others are rectangular, flat across the top. And uh, all of them have been shaped by a hand and chisel. Some of them have broken off in later years, but many of them are so, so been there so long that they're in the ground and you won't find them until you break the turf back. One of the things I wanted to bring up and, and get your input on is uh, the idea that this cemetery at, at the man site and another local cemetery of Scots Irish that I've looked at both have a large central oak tree from which other oak trees have sprung up in later years. These smaller trees are, are less than 100 years old, but the, ma the major central oak tree is uh, over 200 years old. And it grows up right in the center of a, of a person's grave site. So it was deliberately planted there. And you can see from its spreading branches that at the time it came up, there was no forest around it. These other trees came up after the forest had been reestablished in a strait with no limbs. But the old cabbage of an oak tree dates back to the time period of, of the graves being established. Now there's a lot of uh, imagery and, and uh, superstition perhaps, depending on your point of view about oak trees in the Celtic culture and, and at Londonderry in Northern Ireland. And I wonder how much of that was deliberately brought with them and, and put on display at these local Scots-Irish cemeteries. I don't think there's been any study on that, but I think it's worth looking into. This is the earliest image that I've been able to find of the people that settled there. This gentleman on the right is William Mann. He would have been the grandson of the original Gideon man, the, the, the charcoal uh, image that was we're seeing here was done in 1810, give or take a couple of years. Pretty good image, isn't it, girl? Nice job. Pretty good image. Uh, another thing that came out of that community is uh, a legacy of some super superstitions that have been handed down to the present day at least to my early years. Here's a, here's a piece from an article that was written by Rosemary Trott for a Freeport paper that talks about the Scots-Irish of Freeport and their folk tales uh, that, that deal with people who have passed away previously coming back and harvesting the souls of those who have recently passed away. And I believe that this is the source of the tale of the dash 
the uh, privateer that had such a reputation during the War of 1812 that was lost at sea with all souls aboard, showing up whenever anybody who was related to those who passed away passed on in future years. The ship would show up in, in, the, in the fog along the coast of Maine and, and carry the departed away on the ship with them until there was nobody left that was related to the original ship being lost. In my own time, there were those on the wolf, on on the neck down there that would say that they had seen somebody drive in the yard and drive around and around and drive out again whenever somebody passed without making any sound and without stopping and without any any sight of anybody in the car. Uh, it's, it's all rather weird and it all kind of ties back to the superstitions that came to uh, that area with the Scots Irish. My wife's grandfather talks about people having a having a strong belief in witches in that time period, and I'm sure that came from the old country as well. Something to think about. One of another things they, they did amongst themselves to uh, establish community was establish school systems. Of course, there were school systems in the North Yarmouth system, but the Scots Irish were creating their own school systems. And there was a schoolhouse built on Gideon Mann's property at the corner of Burnett Road and Flying Point Road, which eventually rotted down, I suppose, on the sills and became further and further from the center of the settlement. And they replaced it in the early 1800s with a new schoolhouse. And they raised the money for the schoolhouse amongst themselves, anywhere from 20 cents uh, to $3.60 contributed by the people in, within the settlement. That schoolhouse is still standing and is now called the Thomas Means Club. And uh, the picture here is of the descendants of Thomas Mann having a family reunion down there a few years ago. John? John? Yeah. Did you want to mention uh, with regard to that signed petition, the literacy of those petitioners in their yeah. connection with the value of education? I think Thank you, Julie. The, uh, it's very interesting to me, again, talking about the difference in money that was available versus the later Scots-Irish and the idea that many of the Scots-Irish that came in through Philadelphia were, were not very literate. Uh, these Scots-Irish that were studying here in Maine in the early group, the 1718 <coughs> group, uh, were, were obviously literate. They, they signed their own name. They did not sign with an X. Their handwriting is very good. Uh, they established school systems very quickly. And I think it, it's, uh, it's good to remember that the, the, the ideas of our immigrant forefathers being desperately poor and, and, and uh, ignorant of education was not always so especially among the early group. Uh, they had a need to have education to, to establish their bottom-up philosophies of religion and self-governance. It was not a top-down system that they were working in. It was a bottom-up system. And it fit very neatly in with a New England town meeting type of governance from the bottom up. Another thing they did to establish commerce and uh, community was build ships. And it was impossibly expensive for one family typically to be able to build a ship. So they would have shares given uh, amongst themselves and they'd chip in with material and with labor and with money to outfit homemade ships in the area. And this ship was built by one of the Anderson families. It was called the Belfast, interestingly, interestingly enough, and it comes from a notebook that's been handed down to me from the Andersons of, of Flying Point. The Pattons lived next door to the Meanses, and the Patton family also became a very, very substantial shipbuilding family. And this is one of their ships. Wood products were obviously one of the prime output, com commercial output products from the Dummer claim because the, the whole territory was covered with trees and had to be cleared. People were demanding lumber in New England for the growth of the New England market. People were demanding uh, timbers for ships 
and the Woodside family had established a sawmill at Bunganut. And the, saw, the original sawmill was water powered, of course, but this is a, the same location at a later date when they had installed a steam, steam engine to run the operation. So this would have been a house that was built by the Woodside descendants at a location where a sawmill could be set up and it was accessed uh, by the people in the Dummer claim. Interestingly enough, and this is gonna lead in a little bit to what Julie's gonna talk about soon, and that is the American Revolution. Vincent Woodside was the most famous of the Freeport area mast agents. He was in charge of making sure the King's masts weren't used for something they shouldn't have been and made sure they ended up in the King's Navy. Captain William Woodside is, was his father who commanded the blockhouse at McCoy. His father was a firm patriot. The foundations of the Woodside sawmill can still be seen in Bunganut. When the revolution broke out under a mob buried Woodside alive because he was a, he was a Tory under the Liberty Tree in Freeport. He was unearthed, however, by three friends who hid him safely away until danger was passed. The Colonel changed his political viewpoint at that point and he continued to live in Flying Point for many years as an honored citizen and an active in public affairs. So there came a point not too long after they had gotten settled in when the issue of independence rose its head and Woodside getting his money from the Royal Navy and from the English crown uh, was, was a Tory until he decided it wasn't in his interest anymore. Huh. <laughs> <laughs> convincing, yes. Yeah, he, he got convinced, you might say. <laughs> so let's take a look. We saw the original picture of the Dumba claim as an empty territory, but after a couple of decades, we see Woodside Sawmill at Bunganut in operation we see uh, a, a, a crossing point from the Wentworth Man properties. Uh, there was a landing and apparently there was a store or some kind of a trading post established at that point where people were going from this community across to South Harpswell and uh, to, uh, to, to the American Eagle area and helping the Schofield family build ships. The Schofields, the Meanses and the Andersons were all connected. They were all in the shipbuilding business as were the Pattons who lived here between Wentworth and, uh, and Means. You had a schoolhouse established. You had a cemetery, a community cemetery established. You had a blockhouse that was built by the Andersons for self-protection of everybody in the community. You had a shipyard established by the Andersons and a brickyard. You had a salt works established on the man property at Joe Mans Creek where salt was being produced and used for trade uh, instead of trade and barter with anybody that had anything that was worth trading for. And you had a winter ship sheltering area there at Joe Mans Creek, where all of these people who had sailing ships in the summertime would bring them into the creek up into that big cove and let them ground out for the winter and then bring them back out again in the spring to continue their fishing and trading routes. You had a grist mill at Little River where the grain could be ground. And as the cemetery at the Cove got filled up to capacity, the second cemetery was opened at Little River, uh, on the Flying Point Cemetery. So quite a lot of activity in, in the manner of about two decades that took place to establish commerce and trade and uh, a, a viable community unto themselves. Yes, self, self-sufficient, self-sufficient. Self -sufficient. Mm. That self-sufficiency in commerce <clears throat> expanded into the larger area and the larger community. Thomas Means Jr. took over the running of the uh, tavern uptown across the street from where L.L. Beans is now. That would be Linda Beans' uh, restaurant when you're in Freeport Square. And the Jamesons established a business uptown that became Jameson's Tavern, which has been in operation ever since. Uh, some of the descendants of the Mann family currently own a little business that's uh, got a mail order catalog situation called L.L. Beans uh, that's known around the territory pretty well. 
So from that nascent little society of Scots-Irish that scrabbled around and scun their knuckles and pulled together a society at, at the Dumaclean, uh, great things have, have developed. And among those was their impact on the upcoming American Revolution, which Julie's going to talk about next. And I will take questions. You want to entertain questions now? Anybody want to chime in with a question or shall we move on to Julie? Well, I thank you for your attention at least. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right. So you'll need to stop share so that I can uh, launch in. I'll need to do what? Yes, so I'll stop the share here. Okay. Okay, I got it and let there me launch are. back in. Thanks very much. Thank you, John, for that and setting the uh, tone and the foundation here. So our Scots-Irish then leading into and, and uh, being influential in the great cause, the war for independence. So I'm going to focus on the Ulster Scott Patriot, our ancestors and their influences. So. It begs the question, what were the residents of North Yarmouth up to at that time? So the residents, as John had set the foundation, were leaning in to community and economy because they had already been established and rooted on the Dummer claim in this area for some 57 years. So their contributions uh, to the founding and integrity of the United States was they were instrumental in the beginning of this 244 year exp um, experiment in self-rule. And you can see that with John, what John had laid the foundation for the self-governance and self-rule. So the Ulster Scots in North Yarmouth, what was the community response to the battles at Lexington and Concord in April 1775? And even closer to home, the burning of Falmouth on October 18, 1775 by a fleet of Royal Navy vessels. So being closer to home and I'm um, not, uh, where we were situated on the Dummer claim, they may have heard the blasts from there Falmouth Harbor, they may have actually heard the blasts and the bombings and the goings on, he may have carried that far north for them to hear what was going on. So that being closer to home started stirring things. So John, did you want to mention anything about Thomas Means and his um, service in the Thomas, Continental Army? Thomas Means Jr was the son of Thomas Means who got killed by the Indians in 1756. He was born seven months after his father died. And he was raised in, born and raised in the block house that the Andersons built at the end of Flying Point while his mother got remarried to the George Rogers who was a colonel in the militia. Thomas Means Jr. along with the Andersons next door when they heard of the battle at Lexington, Lexington and Concord, left to join the Continental Army in Boston the next morning. They didn't wait, they left and joined General Washington's army. By the time Thomas, he, he re -upped. Thomas Means re -upped three times and stayed throughout the war. And by the time he got done, he was a colonel and uh, had participated in five major campaigns along with General Washington. Thomas Means Jr.'s grandson was named John George Washington Means. So it gives you an idea of the, the, uh, the times that they lived in and, and so forth. Uh, they were rough and ready to go when it came to fighting with the English because prime, for a number of reasons, which, I have, which we haven't got into, but one of the primary ones was the uh, loss of Lewisburg Lewisburg campaign had taken many main men to the eastern and uh, taken the Lewisburg fort from the French in order to put an end to the Indian Wars. And when the war was over, the King of England gave it back to the French. And I'm going to tell you something that wasn't appreciated. <laughs> 
So uh, there was no love lost any longer between the, the uh, Scots-Irish of the Dummer claim and, and the Crown of England. Go ahead, Julie. Thank you very much. Now, an interesting um, factoid that I learned in my researching just a couple of months ago is that Thomas Means Jr. and my fourth generation great grandfather, Joseph Potter, both served at the same time at West Point. And uh, Joseph Potter was born and raised in Hopswell, and he married Eunice Wentworth, the daughter of Silas Wentworth and Margaret Mann. So continuing on with the characteristics or traits of our people, um, the focus was then on, not always, it was always on self, family, and community in that order. And John, did you want to make any uh, comment on that? Well, I, I kind of led through that a little bit, but uh, the theme of all my lectures at some point is always family, faith, and freedom. And I think that's the thread that you'll find throughout all of these early Scots-Irish communities in Maine. It starts with family and the interconnection of family that provided the, the uh, support necessary to be successful in the frontier and the faith to get it done and the freedom that came from owning property. Uh, so if you keep those three F's in mind, you're always going to be on pretty comfortable ground as far as understanding the motivation and the means of success in my opinion, for uh, these first Scots-Irish communities. Okay, and so the push at that time uh, among the um, uh, residents were was for a flourishing community. So I'm gonna get into some of the social aspects now that they listened to each other, they heard each other, they were hearing each other, the focus was on those in the community with the greatest need. It had always been, even from the old ways in the old country, in our community, in our culture. So mobilization um, was not new to them, as John had said. They turned uh, it into community causes and petitions, and you saw a couple of examples of that. So the actions were to dialogue and partner in the community, and they actively did that every day of their lives. The voices of our ancestors, spoke loud and clear that we claimed, cleared, improved, and owned the land. We lived by our clan ways. And the leadership in our community, our pillars of the community were the Andersons and the Chases, the Dunnings, the Manns, the Means, the Rogers, and the Wentworths. So it wasn't based on outside influences. And John, would you like to talk about that for a moment? Uh, the networking that went on among these families, in, anybody that's self-employed in Maine and, and doing it the old Maine way knows it's all about networking. And these early families were, were just tremendous at networking. The Andersons were designing and building ships and they were partnering with the Pote family to, to sail them around the world and, and uh, created the trade routes that, that brought prosperity to the coast of Maine. The Mans and the Means were, were uh, always in business and working together. Uh, the Dunnings, in shipbuilding and the Schofield family shipbuilding and the Anderson family shipbuilding were all interconnected with the same talents and providing each other with the capital needed to be successful. Uh, they weren't going outside of that community any more than they needed to, but but that community was large and extensive and it went not just from the Dummer claim, it reached down back into Falmouth and their connections down there and up into the Kennebec Valley region and their connections there. You will find connections between the Rogers and the Means and others throughout the whole district. But they are all Scots-Irish interconnection, fourth generation. I think it's an Albion seed. David Hackett Fitch Fisher writes about family being connected to, to anybody that's been related within four generations. And within four generations, you're related to a lot of people. And all of those people were expected to be supportive of the other members of that clan. And uh, it certainly bears out uh, throughout this process. As far as being pillars of the community, the first, 
first treasurer of the town of Freeport when it was organized was John Mann. And uh, you'll find these names quickly involved in any uh, civic activity that took place in the larger world around them once they got their own homes established. But everything starts at home. Uh, charity starts at home and with those that are you connected with. So it was a, definitely a uh, community effort, but it was a, a community based on family ties and uh, common backgrounds. Yeah, it wasn't Gideon Mann our first constable. Gideon Mann was a con was a constable. I don't know if he was the first constable or not, but he had a reputation for being a very capable man and. Uh, mm -hmm. Uh, could put down a, a problem in a short order. <laughs> <laughs> a red-headed Scotchman is what they called him. So why would the residents of North Yarmouth, why would our people engage in the great cause? Well, they had a shared settlement among them, sentiment that they, we live in a wonderful place with wonderful people, and we're going to hold on to it. Our numbers don't tell the whole story about us. So we're not really interested in what they think about us. Our numbers don't tell the whole story. Our story goes way back, way back. It's deep, it's enduring, and it's hundreds and thousands of years old. Listening hard to each other revealed a common, sen a common sense of disconnection with authority. So that was something that started to percolate. And then talking with each other builds strength and living and telling our story is healthy in itself. And we've been living and telling our story for millennia. I'll just throw in there that uh, centralized authority has never been a, a big friend to the Scots-Irish people. And there's a, you might say there's a bit of an attitude that, that's developed from that, but uh, if you think of the centralized authority and what it what it did or tried to do to the Scots and the borders and what it did or tried to do to the Scots Irish in the north of Ireland and what it did or tried to do to the Scots Irish in America after they came here and, and got their own piece of land and their own ownership, it was always a, more of a problem than a help. Uh, there's this saying of the, the scariest thing in the world is somebody saying, I'm from the government and I'm here to help. Uh, they weren't much help and, and the Scots-Irish were frontier people that depended on each other and became very suspicious of and uh, averse to centralized government in my humble opinion. Thank you John. So a pervasive not mantra but uh, way of living was that it truly living is, is uh, more than prolonging life. So it became all about the things that matter to our people concerning the conflict, to our tribe, to our clan, and a shared responsibility and a common purpose within our community. So what did they want to preserve and protect? Self-rule. We had stewardship of the land, a sense of place and connection with the land. The value of I am of the land and the land is of me. That's how important it is and how deep it runs. Justice being treated fairly given our historical <laughs> injustices from way back when in the old country being uprooted and displaced multiple times forced us to be self-reliant, hardy, resilient, self-sufficient and a democratic sector of self-governance uh, was pervasive in our community. We are bigger than being in lockstep with others. This is not Massachusetts. And John, did you want to talk about that? I better not. <laughs> <laughs> if you haven't seen it already, we were established and we were living our ways. All right, so we wanted to preserve and protect safety and security, or provide that rather. So that sustenance that John was talking about earlier. We needed to hold on to access to good food, to livestock for our people, for, to restful sleep, to the comforts of home that we cherish, to kinship, love and happiness in our homes, worth fighting for. 
And then for healthcare, caring for ourselves, we want caregivers in our community. You want to grow them in our community. Midwives and doctors and nurses in our community to care for us. So we build a community where people are kind and generous. We want to control over our own future to preserve, nurture, expand, and employ a community that thrives and strengthens trust. And we did that very well. We were very adept at it. And the diligence of keeping it going. How did the residents respond to the threat of being uprooted? Again. <laughs> well, we got revered up. <laughs> <laughs> if you know anything about the history of our clans, right, and being displaced and migrating and this, that, and the other, the border reavers, we got reavered up. Okay, anybody want to talk on that? What reavered up means to you? Your take on that? Well, we mobilize. <laughs> it's a call to action for sure, at minimum. So at center here, feeling alienated, again, by all these outside influences and the hard work that we did to clear and claim and improve and settle and root and all that, um, those alienations um, with merchants and speculators uh, set the tone for being revered up. We uh, built alliances, and here are some of the alliances that were built. So Governor uh, Benning Wentworth was the first provincial governor of New Hampshire, and my sixth generation great-grand uncle, his nephew was Silas uh, Wentworth, my fifth generation great-grandfather married to Margaret Mann. So Wentworth, in those alliances, he was instrumental and in, uh, partly orchestrated the King's Highway and the King's Wood there in the district, uh, King's Woods, uh, for harvesting and for transport and all that, uh, as John had mentioned, for that industry. And lots of land grabbing and the Pine Tree Riot of 1772. He was part and parcel to that, uh, to leading the uh, charge on that. Uh, Silas was born and raised in Dorchester or Stoughton, Mass, and he made his way north to Casco Bay in the 1750s. But he was already starting to feel the burn uh, from his Wentworth family. Uh, was quite established with the London Bay Company in Dorchester, Mass, uh, back in the day. He was apprenticed. Governor Wentworth had him contracted to be apprenticed to the Schofield family in Harpswell. And he and Governor Wentworth owned gobs of land on the Topsom settlement. The Schofield family, as John had mentioned, where uh, their industry is uh, shipbuilding, seafaring, and they grew a number of physicians or medical doctors and then the narrative of the day so talking about current uh, contemporaries and I thought this was uh, uh, quite interesting that the message that uh, the residents of North Elmuth were on the receiving end and hearing over and over again the news coming up from Boston town so from Thomas Paine and his papers and I have uh, quite a library of Thomas Paine. Here's his paper on common sense, quite per se, uh, per, um, persuasive in the principles of fundamental human rights, okay? Um, other readings, the age of reason, rights of man and all that, and then all the shenanigans that the Sons of Liberty were up to, okay, down in Boston town. And Levi Preston, as a contemporary. So I'd like to share uh, something with regard to Levi Preston. So in 1843, Mellon Chamberlain, and Chamberlain should be a somewhat familiar surname to us. He interviewed Levi Preston, who was an aging veteran of the American Revolutionary War, and at 91 years old, Preston had been in his early 20s in 1775 when the British soldiers marched out of Boston to search for arms and rebels in nearby Concord, Mass. So what made you go to the Concord fight? Chamberlain wanted to know. Young man, replied Preston, what we meant in going for those redcoats was this. We had always governed ourselves and we always meant to. 
So you can see the tone here of anonymous, uh, autonomous citizens rather of kind of an enlightened state or sort. So the bottom line, what was the bottom line for our people in North Yarmouth, our community? And I can only imagine my Silas Wentworth, my great grandfather, who was eventually disinherited from the Wentworth family in Dorchester because he got on the right side of the issue. I can only imagine him saying once settled in, on Flying Point that I would rather live and die here being surrounded by loving, generous and happy people than to carry on with the old money the posturing, the chaos, the titles, the politics, and the so-called prestige of a privileged life. In later years, our Ralph Waldo Emerson said on the service of our American Revolutionary War patriots, our Mainers, men and women, these heroes who dared to die and leave their children free. Now on the work cited in this uh, lecture, I'm happy to provide a slide concerning uh, with the uh, references listed if you like, please just send me an email. I'm happy to send that off to you. Um, this lecture is being recorded. We're not quite done yet, but just to let you know it's being recorded so I can definitely send out the YouTube link for you on the recording. You can revisit the lecture as you like. <clears throat> post a recording. But I thought it important given the climate and the influence of our people um, to show um, what the oath of enlistment was in 1778. So this came out of the Continental Congress. They had passed two versions of the oath of office. So I'm talking about John Means and Thomas Means Jr. and Silas Wentworth, okay? And all those who took this oath it applied to military and civilian national officers. It was authored in February, 1778. And John, would you mind reading what our forebears did, swore to? I, Thomas Means Jr., to acknowledge the United States of America to be free, independent, and sovereign states, and declare Lael, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, he's frozen on his end. He had a little bit of an internet. So we'll see what happens here. Hopefully he'll uh, uh, jump back in. If not, it could be what happened yesterday. It might happen. Um, what, what might happen is it might reboot Zoom, but we'll pick up. This is our last slide we'll pick up. <laughs> well, we left off and I'm sure he'll start over. Just in, He might uh, reconnect here in just a moment. They are on the receiving end of a nor'easter. Um, oh, are you? Are you? You've got. Uh, you're still getting snow. No, it's sunny here. Hmm. Is it melting off there, Dave? Uh, it's, it's starting to warm up. I can't say it's melting, but it's sunny. Uh, some areas down in the Portland area have got about 17 inches. Wow. I'm in the I'm in the Augusta area, and I would be pushing it to say we got three inches. I know somebody over in the Booth Bay Harbor said they got about 12. Wow. So it was a good storm. 18 inches in Casco. <laughs> wow. Well, hopefully John will rejoin us here. Tyler, can you hear me all right? I can hear you. Hi, yeah. Uh, if your dad's not able to come back in, would, uh, <laughs> would you mind reading this? It's inappropriate for me to read it. <laughs> It's inappropriate in that it was sworn by a man at the time in service to the United States. So it would be inappropriate for me to speak it. I, Thomas Means, do acknowledge the United States of America to be free, independent, and sovereign states, and declare that the people there. 